welcome everybody tonight to the um, discussion we're going to be having about our uh, concepts for a downtown shared use path project. Uh, really exciting project. Some of you folks may have heard about it. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, in case you don't know me, my name is Andrew Shapiro. Um, I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development. With me this evening I have Jean Enright, our Planning Director. She and I have been kind of uh, working with the team here at GPI to uh, help drive this project forward. And just to give a little bit of a light background before we jump into it, where did this project come from? So way back in 2017, 2018, when the town was doing its master planning process, there was you know very broad discussion and input on wanting the town to have more connectivity, pedestrian and otherwise, um, for you know, areas of the outcountry down to uh, the downtown, uh, being able to improve safety and pedestrian accessibility within the downtown area, being able to have more access to our natural um, assets, things like ponds, streams, rivers, um, and of course the Merrimack River eventually, hopefully. Um, so this is all, that this project emanated from that originally, and then from there we built on that planning process. We did the downtown improvements master plan, which looked at streetscape improvements from the downtown, uh, which we're starting to get started with, and looked at you know whether or not we need to rezone downtown, and it also looked at issues like pedestrian connectivity, trails, uh, and so on and so forth. So there was a concept design in that plan, uh, looking at how to connect Main Street to High Street, uh, and utilizing the area kind of uh, parallel to Main Street that runs along Sutton Pond and Osgood Pond um, and the areas there. Um, and also hopefully connecting up to an existing trail, the Millsta Hill Street, uh, which was established a few years ago that runs from uh, High Street next to the mills over to Wire Hill. So it's, it's a long process, um, but it's one that I hope at the end of uh, we'll be able to, you know, offer some uh, beneficial um, new recreational opportunities to the community, provide some of that additional um, connectivity that we just talked about, um, and from there, um, what I'll do is I'll introduce our consultants we brought on board, Ron Hedrick, uh, Sage Winter, and Kim Armstrong of GPI. They've been helping us develop these concepts. Um, we've already done some outreach with some immediate abutters, but this is our first foray into the broader conversation with the community. Um, I'm sure we'll be having more of these in the future as well. So uh, thank you all for being here. I'll, that I'll toss it over to Ron. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Well, pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for being here. I know the Celtics are on tonight. It's a official game. So 8.30, so hopefully we'll, we won't miss the whole game. Um, as Andrew said, I'm Ron Hedrick. I'm a Director of Landscape Architecture at GPI's New England office. Um, full disclosure, I used to be a North Hanover resident. I lived in town for about 15 years, so this was always, this area was always of interest to me, but I didn't know as much as I know now. And, and hopefully by the end of this meeting, I'll know more, and I hope maybe you, you'll learn something as well. Um, so we have kind of uh, about 60 slides to get through here. I promise I'll go pretty quick. Uh, going to talk about project purpose and need. I think Andrew gave a kind of a good overview of that, so we'll just touch on some of the points of that. We're going to do a little bit of area history, and I, we, we talked about different ways to do this, and what we ended up with was sort of a, some trivia. So I know some of you guys are going to knock this out of the park. I, we, we've already heard people that know all the answers. So uh, we're going to get into the project context then, overview of the plan. We've got a couple large copies uh, laid out in the back, so after the priest presentation, you're welcome to go back there and look them over. We put out some sticky notes. Feel free to ask questions. Write on sticky notes. Tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. We've also, in your handout, um, if you didn't get one, there's a place to leave some comments to us. There's also a QR code on there. We've got a, uh, a, a little survey we put together. So feel free to do that here or take it home and, and answer that, just some quick questions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get going. Um, not terribly formal. Please feel free to ask me any questions along the way. Uh, kind of building on what Andrew said, 2018, the town updated their master plan. I believe the last one had been done around the year 2000, so it's been about 18 years. There was uh, quite a bit in there. A uh, number of themes that were explored. Sorry, I can't quite see the screen from here, but you know, improving the downtown. There, there were things in there about housing, economic development, transportation, um, open space and recreation, and cultural, historical, and natural resources. And, and some of these things really kind of touch on what we're looking at with this project, you know, improving the downtown experience, really bringing quality, a better quality of life, 
connecting people with places, getting people to and from the downtown, getting them to the mills, um, giving them options of how they get places and what they do with their free time, um, and preserving and protecting some of the assets. A number of themes in there. Um, further into the master plan, there's just over 100 of these strategies, kind of implementation elements, and I think the master plan committee is still going on working on some of these. But I pulled out just five of them that all touch upon this. Um, my angle's a little bit poor here. Just real quick, you know, opportunities to enhance the visitation to the downtown, knit together the out country and the commercial and civic centers, um, consider how the town can best make use of the Merrimack River. It's, it's always one of these things, you know, the Merrimack River's right there, but how many people are, are able to get to it. Develop a conceptual plan for the North End over Yahtzee, that's what we're working on tonight. Um, strategy 68, continue to support the work of, of different friends of trail organizations, that type of thing. Um, so, so a lot of those things are very important. So trying to build upon that, I always think of master plans are homework for the town to do, right? These are things that people have said we need to work on, trying to pull that forward. Oops. Sensitive. Um, also, there was more recently, in 2021, a downtown improvements master plan done that was more focused on the, you know, improving the downtown Main Street area, but it did make reference to different connectivity options. As, as Andrew mentioned, there were two options outlined in this, the graphic is from that report, of either using portions of the old rail corridor, which I'm going to get into a little bit, um, or perhaps trying to cross along Osgood Pond to get downtown. Um, there was some initial some initial exploration of the Osgood Pond option, and I think I think that's sort of been ruled out for now. So we're, we're focusing more on, on crossing kind of the, the Sutton Pond location. <clears throat> what are the perceived benefits of this project? Um, it builds on uh, the master plans that the town has, has worked on. Um, it supports the downtown economy, it fosters connectivity, both locally and bringing people into the downtown. You know, the businesses need people coming in, they need residents coming in, you know, it's the old thing about a restaurant. It, everybody goes there once, right, and then never go again. You need to keep drawing people down. So improving quality of life, not just for visitors, but for people that live in the downtown, key part of this. Increases options for recreational activities, restores access to local natural features that some of you may not even know what's within this corridor. Um, and it brings a lot of portions of the town's history, which you're gonna kind of see some of that if you're not already aware of it. Um, and I, I really like the, we work on a lot of these long trails. People always think it's from somebody that gets in the beginning and goes to the end. It's really about people jumping on and off at different places. It's, it's like a train, right? You get in one car and you never, you don't necessarily ride the whole train. Um, area history. So a little trivia. If you know the answer, raise your hand. Um, I'll just call on somebody. So the first, the first question is, what is the name of the stream that drains from Lake Kotekawik down through the center of the downtown? Anybody? <laughs> you didn't raise your hand. Yes, Kotekawik Brook. Or if you look at old maps, it's also listed as Kotekawik River. Uh, I, I, I like Brook because it's not, to me, really a river. It's not big enough, but um, it doesn't really matter. But it's, a, it's about a 1.6 mile stream that drains from the lake into the Merrimack River. Um, it winds its way down through. It was uh, North, North Andover, and I put that in quotations because if we remember our history, it was all part of Andover at one point, was, was settled in 1636 under, uh, and that's what it was originally called under the, the sort of the Native American name for it. Um, in the writings of the purchase of the land, they talk about Alewife and the brook and giving rights to a, a man named Roger, actually, in his, his band. But uh, they talk about Alewife running there, which dams obviously stop. Uh, and, and the first settlements referred to it as a fair street of sweet water. <laughs> um, so that's important because we have this, this stream corridor that runs down through here. It's much disguised by overgrowth um, in, in the ponds. Um, next question, what are the names of the four mill ponds located along the brook within the downtown area? Anybody? Oh, that's good. Even. That's not me. 
Osgood yeah. Stephen yeah. Sutton. You cut that off my plan, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sutton Pond, Osgood Pond, uh, Mill Pond, and Stevens Pond. I guess Davis Ferber Pond was didn't roll off the tongue too well, so um, it, maybe I'm giving away too much. Uh, can you name at least one of the former mills? And there, I'm aware of at least five. So one of them's rather small, so it gets overlooked. Anyone? What do you say, Davis? Stevens Mills, uh, which is no longer there. That's where the Mill Pond condos are, up by Stevens Pond. Uh, the North Andover Mills, later known as Osgood Mills, is now this Sutton Pond condominiums. Uh, the Sutton Mills are actually down there, but the story I've heard is that the upper half of that building was taken off, so you wouldn't recognize it so much as a mill building. <coughs> the Davis and Fervor, which is you know kind of seeing a, a renaissance with all the restaurants and use that's down there. And then the Schofield Mill, right, right down there on Sutton, um, Sutton Street. And there were other iterations of these mills before they became these larger machines. Most of them, I think, were textiles. Davis and Ferber made carding machines. Does anybody know what a carding machine is? I didn't. It's for wool, right? Wool, these massive machines that process wool. Did your study go all the way past Sutton Mills to the Merrimack River, or did you stop it? We stopped at Sutton Street. Yeah. So Sutton Mill is the one that's across Sutton Street. With that's Charlie's. Charlie's. Okay. Yeah. Charlie took the top two stories out. Yeah. Can you get Charlie to put him back? <laughs> <laughs> no, but Steve might. <laughs> um, just a couple more of these. Do you know the original name of the railroad that once ran alongside the brook? That one might be a little harder for some. Yes. Yeah. Foster and Edge. Yes, the original name, actually. Oh, I threw that in there. Because <laughs> I said, well, Boston Main was, Boston Main, a lot of railroads have a history of they, they created themselves and then they leased themselves. They were sort of like endeavors. The original name was the Essex Railroad. <coughs> and I think when it became Essex Railroad. Yeah, and I, I think once it was leased, it changed its name. I've seen names of like Lawrence to Salem and things like that. It yeah, used to run up to Salem, and then on 97, there was a railhouse up there. Yeah. And then it used to go to Canopy Lake and then all the way up to Salisbury, right? And then they shut it down. And that's the one. Because they, they, this, these mills used to own a series of Shadow Brook, Millville Lake, Big Island Pond, and they yeah. created power to run all that all the way up from New Hampshire and save the water to create the energy to run these mills. Yeah, the story a lot of the railroads is they didn't survive very long because I think they were endeavors by business people that maybe didn't know the railroad business so much and, and, and the railroad had, you know, they found the most efficient lines and abandoned the ones that didn't really serve their purposes. What but kind of rights does the town have? Because there are through the railroad system. So by way of example, over Sutton Pond, what's the town's position on their rights over where the former bridge was? So my understanding is the uh, that's a portion that is still owned by the railroad, as far as we can tell. Even though they abandoned it, they actually took it down, and then, generally speaking, would have lost all their easements, easement rights. It's, it's a it's a deeper conversation because there there's a lot of like caveats in there that are better done by somebody other than myself. But that but the piece that goes from Main Street in is still part of the railroad, correct? So access from Main Street in would be easily... That's, that's what the required. records show, is that there's a piece of land that comes in from Main Street, crosses the pond, and goes over to a point where, basically to Avalon, and I think Avalon purchased a piece of the old right away. And was it, so was it owned by a private freight company or some of those no, it was, chunks of track? it was owned by B&M. Yeah. The title shows it all the way back, but I think that Perhaps it's missing certain spots. I'm curious um, whether there's still reserved rights in the railroad on the other side of Sun Pond all the way down to High Street. Yeah. I, and whether those are abandoned or not. I, I think the answer lies in there's probably a title search that needs to be done to really verify all of it. Um, I did it, so if you want to talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope to get the job. <laughs>
so that was the Essex Railroad. Uh, just a couple pictures I found online. This depot was down on Sutton Street where there's, I think, a cabinet dealer now. They, they say it's the same building, but it looks nothing like this. This was a, a small station at Marble Ridge. There were a couple stations throughout town, like in Stevens Street. And, and everybody probably knows the arch going into Wire Hill, um, which is just a very cool piece. And here's an old map showing the railroad, which this one refers to it as the Salem and Lawrence Railroad. Um, just a quick kind of putting all that together. Why, why go through all this? Like, why I'm fascinated by history. <laughs> I'm fascinated by the Industrial Revolution, trains and all that. Um, kind of a quick walkthrough of this. You can kind of see it all together. Um, you know, starting down here from the, what's still the active, the active railroad. Um, you know, the MBT commuter rail. This is where it branched off. Here was the depot. Came across Main Street, crossed Sutton's Pond by a trestle, went up through um, through the lands here now that there's like Clean Harbors, Avalon North, so on and so forth. It kept going all the way, and I'll show you in a minute. It, it ran almost right up, it was like the spine right through the middle of the whole town. And all the pink areas are the, some of the mills. How much of that is still connected? So, for instance, if there were uh, an interest in building a fish run, for example, on the Sutton Pond Dam. Mm -hmm. Is there access from Sutton into Osgood, Osgood into? It's all dam control. It's all dam control. There's a dam at every yeah. single one of those ponds. Yeah. But is there an open culvert? No. No. No, all of them have a, a pretty good hydraulic a hydraulic jump, so the, the, I don't think it's anything that the fish would be able to. Unless you built it. Well, well they could run a fish elevator. Yep. They could. You'd but have they'd to. Have the big dam. Mm -hmm. Have you guys worked on those before? Fish, um, I've worked on yes. So I think there's a, a there was a push maybe at Sturbridge, but I can't remember was looking at trying to get that information hmm. now. But there was state grants available, and they actually for public viewing when they redevelop, mm -hmm. they put the fish run in. I think most of it got funded. Yeah. But that's not something you worked that one you didn't work on. No, I know. I know. Or don't think so, but. Yeah, years ago, before um, these dams were put in, they actually had a salmon run come up through the Merrimack, and the walleye would come through this section and mm -hmm. go into Lake Kachikwe. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I run a fishing page on social media, about 9,000 people, Merrimack, were fishing. And there's a lot of different stories and history with this area from guys back in the 50s and 60s before everything really uh, got messed up environmentally. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, like, trying to have an envi environmental mindset, making it kid friendly, um, a destination that's not just going to get used once and that people are going to want to stay active in that area would be incorporating something that, you know, fishing could be involved with right. the kids right off of there. And then instantly to, um, with my knowledge with what's happening with that tr the rail trail that's connecting from Lawrence, Methuen up to Salem, and they want it to go all the way along the Merrimack here. Um, go up to Havel, and they're going to connect it to the rail trail that's up in Havel, and that's state funded already. Right. So I didn't see anything on there that's connecting it to there. Are you guys trying mm -hmm. to connect to the river? We're trying to get pieces in, and the thought is eventually a lot of that network will get pretty figured out, but it, it's until you get pieces done, it's hard to get any momentum through it. Mm -hmm. So again, if you tried to do the whole entire trail, it's something that would never get funded. So we're and some of that rail yeah. trail money is, is uh, that, that Merrimack River Trail is just bonded. It's, the, the, it's not actually funded. It's, it's in a bond bill, but no one's actually put money behind it. Mm -hmm. I call it funny money. <laughs> so it's like well, a potential future project. The money has been set aside, but it hasn't been authorized. Mm -hmm. It's been like that for almost 20 years. Yeah. It's just authorized still, to still someday still give money to do it yeah. when it exists. Work. So it work makes out. people feel good, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but there's no money. We could ask the governor. Maybe the yeah. governor would give us some money, but it's just off. it's not authorized yet, which is unfortunate. Well, it's, it's, cool it's, get, it's getting close. I mean, I yeah. do a lot of philanthropy work, work, work with a lot of politics in Lawrence, and they're trying to develop that area and prep it already to prepare for it. So um, they've already come come in, and they've been receiving a lot of funds yeah. um, from and the Greater Action community, community Action. Center and they received it, a good amount. So it's it's work. It's doing a lot better than it was 20 years ago, oh, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So as far as fish and wildlife, 
David Rand was the kid who grew up on that farm. And Dave, when you were a kid, what was in this area? Well, uh, <laughs> I grew up living on Pleasant Street, and those houses were built right after the Civil War. And uh, I, that's that's my territory. That's why I spent my young years of my life. You look great for 1865. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. uh, oh, my father, my father. Uh, he, my father fished for airways in in Kajikwik Brook, yeah. and uh, in that in in that time frame, you could you could walk, uh, you could walk all the way from the Merrimack River all the way up to uh, to Lake Kajikwik, and, right. and then when the mills came in, uh, they they dammed off, they put up the obstructions so they could. Uh, take the water and use it for the dye. In fact, for most of my young lifetime, uh, you could tell what color the uh, mill was making the cloth by the color, by the of, color the of the water. The water, water <laughs> coming down, down the brook. And, uh, and that was, that was uh, unfortunately what happened to it. And, and, uh, but it, it, it's a magnificent area and, and just, I think it was the week before last, I was sitting with the town manager and, and the assistant town manager, and I mentioned this project to him. And I, I said to both of them, I said, this is, this is a magnificent opportunity for the town of North Andover to be able to do something that you can't find uh, in too many places in, in the entire country today. Right. Uh, and and uh, I I I just hope that everybody will get on board because there isn't there isn't that many times in a lifetime when you find so many people willing and able to cooperate with each other right. and to accomplish something as 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 nice as this. And the nice part about it is that it's intended to be. Uh, a, to, to be handicap accessible. And right. that's one of the things that I brought up with the town manager uh, a couple of weeks ago, but there aren't that many places in the town of North Ando that are handicap accessible. And, and this, it, this to me is, is uh, it, it's just a godsend, really. And I think more than just handicap for kid accessible, too. Yeah. I, I grew up, um, my name's Sam Sleep, I live at 102 Second Street. Uh, I lived in town for over 30 years. Mm. My son lives here, he's 10 years old. And I grew up making forts in those woods, coming around, like going through there, the tunnel to the Merrimack. We've explored every inch of that area. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and uh, thank God I'm still alive today. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the elderly and then making it accessible for the kids um, and looking at, like, the plans, how it goes on the back side of Avalon there. Mm -hmm. um, that's incorporating the outside <laughs> from the downtown. I think, like, trying to work on the, this side of it, like outside here, on the other side of Saunders Street, if we, and it's a steep slope there, but if it, things were incorporated more on this side, it would keep it so kids are from downtown can go right to it here, yeah. opposed to having to cut down the, through the bridge there, which they don't, the Sutton Pond guys, they really don't want any kids over there. They do like, get out of here, they'll kick you out. Yeah. But, um, you know, really incorporating this side of downtown would be important. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can't get the whole thing, you're sh shooting for a smaller pro like portion of the area so you could get funding for it, would be like, really focusing towards the downtown where the, the kids really don't have that sidewalk space, the elderly people don't have that accessibility. Yeah, so you guys are stealing a lot of my thunder here. So <laughs> let, let me, let me, let me, that's all right. Let me move on here. So this this is just a stroll through. This is a 1906 map, just sort of shows you the what it looked like back in 1906, all the way up to Stevens Pond. Um, my last trivia question, and I know some of you know this. What was the old trestle that crossed the? Uh, the what? Dizzy Bridge. Dizzy Bridge. <laughs> now does anybody know why it was called that? I thought it was way up in the air. 
Probably it's probably dangerous. Everybody was drinking. Dangerous. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rite of passage. <laughs> so yeah, so it was the Essex Railroad trestle, but it was known locally as the Dizzy Bridge. Um, it's if you've ever walked across a tight bridge like that, it is very disconcerting because you have to be very regular about your football. Um, so getting into project context, this is where I think you, you were starting to go a little bit. So. The yellow box is kind of our study area. It's really kind of Sutton Pond over to High Street, Main Street, um, kind of over to High Street. Um, I will let you know that the town is working with another consultant looking at the piece along Stevens Pond um, and maybe a little bit further afield that, um, you know, there, it is being sort of, I, I think the master plan, look at the old, the old rail corridor. Um, the piece in the middle is a little bit prob more problematic here, and I know back in the mid-90s, I, I know people were stuck starting to talk about this, but portions way out in the out country uh, have been sold off and developed, so that becomes a bigger challenge of how you get there, because there is a rail, town, a rail trail developing in the next town over, and that would get you to the border of Boston system. So it, it's, it's one of those things, maybe jumping on the bandwagon here a little late, but, but still there's opportunity to, to seize it. And I, I agree with what you said. There's a lot of, there's history, there's nature, there's, there's access and, and recreation here that I, I think. Why is that our section problematic? This section in here? Is that what you meant? I understand. Oh, I, I think there's already like a, the, there's a trail some, there. Right? Yeah, the, the town has worked to build some pieces through here. Um, I know there's a lot of wetlands next to the high school. I think Wire Hill is under the trustees of the reservation control, and I'm not sure they are as open to it. But I think, I always describe it as you build this and you build this, and it becomes obvious what's missing. So it, it needs to get inertia. Otherwise, it's always like, ah, oh, it'll never happen. So probably but so, I, I thought you had suggested that the orange piece was problematic. Perhaps you meant farther out country. Well, definitely further out because it's all been developed. Yeah. It's, it's like people's yards out there. That's the cut through. Like most kids that go to the high school, yeah. they're walking from downtown to the high school. They're cutting through that area. They don't walk the, the, the road there. Yeah. So it's already a beaten path there. It is. My understanding there is perhaps. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 They think that the kids, I mean, like, yeah, right. and when we cut through with our bikes, the kids are getting yeah. something, you know, because we'll use that to cut through, yeah. Yeah. cut through right in the back side of the foot, and the um, where the parking garage is, yeah. and then to the like apartment buildings behind McDonald's there, yeah. Yeah. that whole yeah. path, it used to be a static path around the back of the one that's chick in there. Broke there, mm -hmm. um, but there was a big construction that went down. They cut down a lot of it and then ruined that path that was along the brook. So you stay on that road going to the end of the apartments are, and there's a little cut through, cut through the there. Yeah. But now the apartments are going out, and it's kind of you see the kids coming through all different directions now. So yeah. that'd be important to put that in the study, you know, making it more accessible for school kids walking to school that don't have transportation. No. He's one of these most along the Davidson Trail and uh, the uh, Davidson Trail held it down right on uh, East Water Street. And Stephen held it down uh, right, right along the Chicago Brook. Hmm. In fact, uh, back in about 19, uh, 1947 48, they came in and dynamited the new channel for ticket for particular crook to run to uh the clock. Because that the the the, 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 the ended through through a swamp. Right. And they wanted to straighten it out so they did. Mm. And they uh they was, they they dynamited the brook and chase all muskets up into the house. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, pulled in the local land use, uh, really the zoning map to show local land use. All the sort of beige, yellowy color in its various forms is residential. So you can see within, I don't know if you can see these two circles. This is a five minute or quarter mile kind of walking circle. Here's a half mile, sort of a planner's 10 minute walk from sort of a, a center to all that. So there, there is a tremendous amount of housing 
within a walking distance of this. Um, and, you know, the ability to move around, this would just, this, this would uh, complement all that in, in many forms. So, in order to design that bridge, mm -hmm. wouldn't you have to, in essence, do a, a study, uh, like perhaps you would use the word survey, of all the water bodies all the way to Lake and Chicklet, to study volume yeah. and go through? So that's, no matter what, you'd have to do that survey and that study, correct? I'll rely on Kim. Okay, as part of the, the yes, we have to, we, whatever we do, we have to prove that we're not changing the, the rise for the female water populations. Um, we're pretty close to the Merrimack there, so it's really just kind of the properties on the other side of Sutton Street that you'd really have to study. And you but in order to do that, you chase it all the way back to Lake and Chicklet. So you, you do that in order also to set the elevation of the crossing over Sutton Park, yes. correct? Because you need to know where to put the bridge, because you need to be above the um, head of the earth. In essence, you do the LIDAR study, figure out what the topo is. LIDAR the actually water. doesn't work in the water because it can't see through it. So, so that's you have to actually go on six or by that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, is, would that be classified as a flood zone, like FEMA? Yes. It is? It is currently. Yeah, so you have to go to the back regularly. Uh, right. right, so if we're changing anything, so that's why we have to make sure we're above the flood elevation. Uh, with enough clearance that we're not changing what's called the base flood elevation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you can't change the mass. They're, they're cool. Yeah, if you change the maps, it's it, it requires a coal mar and it's a um, act of God to get those through all the time. So oh. the problem is you're, you're you're changing the flooding, so you're you're making upstream people flood potentially more or downstream people flood potentially more, mm -hmm. and because of that, they they try really hard to just discourage it. So we just try to stay above the flooding elevation so we don't impact it. You can't work. You can't work. It could happen. I've uh, worked on floodplains up in Haverhill when a guy had a bad experience with a fire, but they ended up making him, he had an existing grandfather in foundation, full foundation, they actually made him fill it with sand after they, they came in, the neighbor called on him because he was encroaching and that opened a can of worms because they knew the people in the conservation in town, but the conservation really wasn't kind of connected federally to FEMA. And then FEMA came in and was like, no, you have to do one for one. Anything you take out, you're going to put one in. So it's, it gets difficult. But they were able to work with them and get the right permits to have mm -hmm. some sort of space there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's yeah. it's something that if we can avoid it, which is what we, we typically try to. Mm -hmm. When Stephen's mill was taken down and mill, the mill pond uh, complex was built, in order to get sufficient frontage uh, for the, some of the mill pond condominiums, they had to they had to use the mill the pond itself in front of the, in front of the condominium. That that mill that pond is divided up into into pieces, mm. and each each one of those frontal uh, units owns a part of that pond. And so that that's you know that's another thing uh, mm. that that uh, another thing that happened over the years uh, as far as Stevens Mills and Jen. So Ron, is that the bridge that that red line? This this red line is sort of the trail alignment that you'll see on the plans. Yeah. yeah, the the actual bridge is right here. The, the, the zoning map has two lines. Okay, I don't know why it shows up that way. Yeah, exactly show, where, show that where that bridge yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'll You'll show you a little bit better. Yeah. So, a number of stakeholders, obviously the town, the different the different departments in the town, the butters to the project, residents, business owners, and other visitors and, and local employees. Um, I'll get into the plan now, kind of give you an overview of it. Um, what we're, what we're looking at is about, um, I think it measured out as about a half a mile from Main Street over to, to High Street. It starts down on Main Street, and I'll just kind of zoom in on these areas and go along. So sort of down near the end of uh, High Street, you know, the old stone mill that's down there, uh, the old warehouse. It, it starts kind of between a salon and, and some um, apartment units. Goes in through there, and I'll have some visuals to show you in a second here. We cross Sutton Pond via a new a replacement of the old trestle bridge. It would then, pardon me, it would then come across, and here is the old rail corridor 
that I spoke of runs up and stops at Avalon, we would be looking to come in and come closer to the pond to, to take advantage of the pond setting, make improvements to the woodlands in here. Um, I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like, but not be right back against the, the back of this building. And we've had some preliminary conversations with them about that. Um, these two kind of side paths, we're looking for the most connections, the most connections we can have. So coming along over here, maybe taking advantage of a view, pardon if I'm in the way, from the top of the dam back to the pond or perhaps over to Sutton Street, another potential connection here. And then as it moves along, comes around Avalon North. This old ball field here is now classified as a wetland. It's, it's wet um, quite a bit. It's a, it's a wet meadow. So we would be navigating up behind this, staying away from the new apartment buildings. There's a piece of land that Avalon owns that actually connects out to Purley Road. We would see that as a fantastic connection for the neighborhood here to have access to the trail. Um, we come up and around. There's, there's sort of a wetland pocket here that we'd have to navigate by a smaller boardwalk to, to be able to get that approved through Conservation Commission. Maybe I'll try over here for a while. Um, and then come down through here. In preliminary conversations with Avalon North, they have a fire lane that comes to about here. We've, we've, we've talked about potentially using that as a piece of the trail. It, it's only there for fire trucks. Fire trucks only come when there's fire. Um, hopefully it'll never be used beyond what we would, we would want to use it for. And then we've sort of worked the concept through here that we've, we've discussed with them coming through the parking, crossing at... Um, and I have cross a question on the, yes. on the crossing high street. Yes. What exactly um, is going to happen? you know, a bridge or something? Because it's a very, very busy street. I live on High Street. I, I think we see that as a crosswalk. And, and whatever Just a measures, crosswalk only? Yeah, whatever measures would be necessary to make that safe would be part of a design evaluation. Oh. Um, advanced warning signage, sometimes they do these, um, you know, the flashing yellow kind of lights. Very um, busy street. It is. But it, it may be also an opportunity to slow the traffic there, so there may be an app. Speed bump. Yeah, a combination of a traffic calming with that crosswalk. Before you move this side, if you don't mind, on the <laughs> proposed open space. Yes. In order to kind of, or perhaps look at a different alternative, how much research have you guys done into pulling that walk more into that proposed open space and coming around the back side of Sutton Pond? Did you do a title search? as to who has the fee interest in that land? That was actually the initial concept, is we were thinking that because that, that's the old rail corridor. But the way that Avalon built those apartments, you'd be coming through right next to people's like, rooms and looking at their windows. Yeah. Are, you, are you asking about oh. going here or yes. here? Oh, You're sorry. asking about going here. Yes. Um, couple challenges. One, they were not very open to the project. But that's on the assumption that they own that land. Two, two is there's a dam in the way, so there's a significant vertical change there that we that would have to be navigated. Um, yeah, the elevations are pretty high from yeah. from uh, Mill what's the pond of the Mill Pond. Mill Pond. Uh, Oscar pond. Oscar. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 the elevation drop from the waterfall that's there mm -hmm. all the way down is at least like 30 feet. It's pretty big. How about a cross, a recross, but another bridge that goes just from from the cost savings perspective. I wonder if it's better to, to take a project and crowd it in and around the feature of the Because you pond. see, yeah, you can see that bottleneck right there. It's a lot closer. It'd be a smaller bridge. So that you do both. You cross up on the form of Disney Bridge, mm -hmm. and then you come along the pond side. You build a park on that open space where it used to be. Even when I was a kid, that was pretty open. And that would be a restaurant restoration project. I think it's reasonably easy to crowd it You're talking about down here. Cr crossing back to here? No, down a little bit more than cross. Like down over here. Yeah. I think the cost difference might be it might be quite similar. And you stay and you keep the project within that farm. I, I think. Well, it, I'll move to the next one. I think it, it complicates the, the trying to get back to the High Street and, yeah. and, and points further north. But another thing is like you. We're talking about like keeping it closer to downtown. So if you go down mm -hmm. to the end of Sutton Pond. 
uh, what it repeated dialysis is, that's not really like downtown. You know, like what right. we're here is, is all along that back area on the other side, mm -hmm. in which we're going the opposite way to the other side. Yeah, it's, it's already pretty much connected to that area by those regular beaten paths. The main trail has, we do have sidewalks on this side, and there aren't as many sidewalks on the other side. Yeah, but that's not going to draw in the people to keep coming back and having scenery, a good walk routine for their pets and the kids. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I will say that we we are we are trying to like like a route find the path of least resistance right. and and I also have described this as there's a hierarchy that this would be the main path these would be connector paths so they would be of a smaller size they're a way to get to and from the path but the sort of the collector path is the the main path if there are opportunities for future connections I wouldn't rule that out but I just know that in in initial conversations to try to cross down here, there was a lot of resistance to it. And there was a lot of challenges to some of the grades and stuff, so. Um, does that path the way it is, does that stay at roughly the same grade when you go behind the buildings like that? We've done an initial sort of. It's like very steep. Yeah, we've done, most, most of it to about here is fairly flat, but right through here it goes up. But we've, we've looked at it, we believe we can get it in at 5%, which would mean accessibility. Um, because yeah, what's the percentage for a walkway with the state? Is it like 0.2 percent grade? Okay. Like going. Wait, wait, yeah. is this going to be federally funded? No, or state uh, funded. Uh, uh, maybe maybe seven and a half percent. Yeah. 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 But yeah. you can only do that for so long. Yeah. And then Anything over five percent is considered a ramp. So yeah. now you're into landings and handrails yeah. and that sort of thing. So from a design standpoint, though, wouldn't like, and I understand you have to get back over the high street to cross. But wouldn't the focal point and, and perhaps the main area for anyone would be the pond itself? So like on that proposed open space, perhaps there's a discussion about you know, boating or canoeing, it's a seven acre pond. It's a third of the size of Stephen's pond. It's pretty deep. I think that, um, I, I think the connectivity between this area and High Street is an important part because as I showed on that map, you've got neighborhoods kind of on either side of Main Street, mm. either side of the brook, but you've also got them on the other side of High Street as well. And then, you know, you, you start to look sort of further out, and that's where you start looking at the high school. So who owns the road going past something on front? Is that privately owned, or is it time to it, or is that? From what we found, something owns that something Hong Kong on that road. Yeah. I would assume we'd have a human rights right? after all those years. The town doesn't want to because there's a dam on any bridge. Okay. So, so um, no good progress. It's sad because that's like the route where everybody, we all come, all the kids, yeah. they all come down through yeah. here through my generation, the, the next generation right. coming in now. Yeah. It's just like the way it is, the landscape of the demographic of it. Right. And Crossing High Street, we, we look at kind of continuing. This is the, this is where the old rail corridor ran, sort of following along that, and then connecting into the Mills to Hills Trail with, with potential for, for future connections out from beyond. Is that built around Mill Pond? Yes. Yes, a large part of it is, and, and the new development here is building, I believe, this piece in here. So that that is already taking shape. And that's the agreement that exists between Steinberg, the owner, and the Orange Entity, and East Mills, and the town that they got funding from CPC for that, for the design, I guess. Did you guys do the original design? No, no, that's, I, I can't speak to how that was funded. Um, so the path, as I said, it's about a half mile. It's, uh, it would be a 10 foot path with two foot shoulders. This is what's typical of what they call a shared use path um, or a multi-use path. Why a shared use path? Uh, I think some of you have already said it. It accommodates uh, all users, provides universal access because it's built to the grades of, that need accessibility, unlike a, a foot trail or a hiking trail, which you know is you sort of, you're out there to kind of rough it. The longevity of trail like this is typically 
longer because of the way it's built. It reaches a wider user group. Um, I always like to say, you know, you can be out there on a bike, you could be walking, you could have a child in a stroller, you could be, uh, you know, have ambulatory issues where it's just a nice level path and, and, and it's firm and stable. The cost of, when you're looking at building something like rebuilding the bridge over the Sutton Pond, that investment makes a lot more sense if you invest in a path like this. It's, it's typically more sustainable just because it's built of materials that are going to hold up longer. And, and it gives a greater feeling of safety and security, partly because it's wider and it's, you know, any, anything sort of set in stone kind of seems like it's more permanent. I always trust the railroad more than I trust the bus because I know where it's coming and going, you yeah. know. So, uh, Ron, does a, a path that wide allow emergency access to? It can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not atypical. We've been requested to build for ambulances. I don't think I've ever seen. They don't, typically, they're coming from a side street. They don't drive it, but, but it can. It certainly aids in maintenance. Have you guys looked at parking at the trailhead, if we call it this beginning of South Street, the trailhead? We've had some preliminary discussions about that. Um, you know, that you never know until you build these things what the, what the draw would be. There, there's a lot of parking downtown. And I think the conversation will probably go somewhere along the line of, you know, you don't want, you certainly don't want people only using the trail that takes somebody's parking space for their business or their residence. Um, you have to sort of plan ahead for that. There's been some preliminary concept uh, discussions about that, but nothing, nothing drawn up. Um, it's a pretty significant piece to sitting in a vacant dormant because of other issues in between your, your, the condominiums in Davida, which is, I call it Laidlaw, I don't remember who the new company is. Yeah, it was is it Clean Harbors? Clean Harbors, yeah. 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 yeah, there is a lot of land in there. And they lease it to a landscape, so that's like a park. Yeah. If this ever is took off and you had canoeing and biking, mm -hmm. it would be a fabulous place mm -hmm. if you could get them to donate East. that or, or give it to them. I don't think you can do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can do a lot of it. You can pay it. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, just good, but I'm just gonna keep going here, just mindful of time. Because I know some people want to see this help. Uh, so some of the private project offerings, uh, just real quick. Access and connectivity, we've talked about kind of cultural historical pieces, you know, uh, attractive, accessible and welcoming de uh, welcoming design, things like kiosks. Etiquette signs, you know, how, how to use the trail, please don't walk on private property. Vehicle parking, uh, bicycle parking. Cultural, historical is more, more, more about uh, public art and, and opportunities to learn about the, the history of this area. Um, interpretive sign panels, that kind of thing. Let, you know, access alone is gonna kind of put you in touch with what it was all about. Uh, nature immersion, a kind of term we like to say, leave your outside world for maybe even just 10 minutes, go for a walk. Uh, places to pull off the path to see a scenic view or, you know, view of the downtown or a view of a pond, place to sit or uh, just take in the, the noises of nature. And then uh, recreation and exercise, places to walk, to run, to jog, to just go out and, and be outside. And just some sort of visual, <laughs> those types of things. Uh, and then the term I like was unlocking the landscape. There really is a lot of landscape in here. And you see it on the plans. We kind of brought up the color on some of the, so the, the wooded areas. Uh, here's a long view of the pond from the dam. Uh, you can see the remnants of the old trestle kind of still crossing the, the pond. This is the old ball field up at Avalon. Doesn't look like a ball field anymore. Yeah. It's kind of a, it's a ball field. Yeah, it's a kind of a neat place. Um, this is looking at the mill pond, sort of back towards uh, Davis and Ferber, and then just some of the trees that are that are out there. So I call that the good. Uh, here's some of the bad. You know, it's just years of neglect in a lot of these areas. Um, oh, what's that picture on the left? I, I don't know that place. No. <laughs> the place looks better now. You know those, those broke, those falling over trees. Yeah, just just a lot of go to those, Christina. A lot of debris. No one cut those. Those are falling over. <laughs> That's right. Um, 
some remnants of the railroad. This was over on the Clean Harbor side, heading out to the old trestle. Uh, this is our, this is Japanese knotweed. Everyone probably knows that. It's very notorious and very, very difficult to get rid of. Um, here's another picture up behind Avalon, just the thickets of vines. Um, some places it's hard to even climb through there. And then here's kind of the edge of the pond. Again, just a lot of debris from over the years. This is um, Asiatic better, better sweet all through the trees. Um, it just it weighs down the trees, breaks them down, and it just it makes the whole place look like a, you know, uh, a haunted forest. <laughs> Uh, Would you do a whole landscape restoration as part of the rest as part of the whole riverfront restoration? I would well? like to see that, and I, and I think because some of these are in conservation areas, I think that's part of the. What the compound would require. I think it's part of the sort of the going through, kind of trying to, to you know, improve the make improvements for the things that we're. Maybe get like a, a an Eagle Scout project going for the local group. Volunteer armies are quite handy when you're trying to deal with invasives to treat things and stuff, but they, they just have to be under the supervision and it has to be kind of done through the conservation commission. So. Have you ever paired up or, or, thought, or talked to Audubon on this? I know I was there two days ago, and as usual, the eagles are sitting in the oak trees on top of the dam fishing. And I, and I don't know if, um, if that's been part of your discussion as well. Not to date, but I, I think as any part of a, the, you know, the design process communications with fish and wildlife and uh, on natural, natural species and that kind of thing. Is so do you get osprey to be introduced there as well? Or they come that, I know they're all the way past table. You're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so if you said all that, that. <laughs> quick question, An environmental engineer, gone over endangered species, like, you know, there's different endangered salamanders and, and yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's that occurs as part of every project, as part yeah. of the permitting. That's something that's required. Yeah. Is it any diligence done in that already? Or? It is not occurred yet. No. No, we're, we're kind of at the concept and just trying to make sure that the concept is acceptable before you go too far with that engineering study. Yeah. I know in every project, I've done probably four or five projects along the Merrimack, and every one of them, it's, it's always sturgeon and bald eagle are the two prominent rare species you encounter. And, and there's usually, you know, as long as you're not doing an X or Y, it's not a problem. Like like you said, the eagle like the, the perch in the high trees and fish from them. So if you're not cutting high trees, it's usually not a problem. Um, but that all has to be. are up in April. Not really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up in the pedlars. Yeah, they look up over there in the tents. Yeah. Bods, they stay high up in the great portrait. Yeah. But all, all that's a level of detail that would be explored as the project moved into. We're at like a conceptual design that would be. Would you have a plan B if you wanted to something like that? We would have to find a plan B. Yeah. It depends on what the problem is. So what's your time on? Um, what's your funding source? What's the time stop on that? I, I, think the, I think the first goal is to finish this up, see where we, we end up. See if there's sort of a general acceptance of the concept, and then I think it's it's moving on from there. So, and not to um, for more specificity, what's that? What does that mean? Like, what's your criteria? What's like support mean? Five hundred people. I think that's a question probably better for Andrew or Eugene than myself. I didn't hear the first part of that, but I would just say you know we're getting like a lot of the questions. Yeah. All good questions and mm -hmm. all and all good suppositions. Endangered species. How's this going to work? But really, we're at the literal <laughs> front end of this project, of and th you know these are concepts. So we want to get the concept embraced, and then it gives us sort of the the backing to say, okay, let's go to step number two, and then step number three, of which there'll be several steps, right. including you know a lot of the, the issues that you guys are are rightfully asking about, including how we're going to fund this. So I think all valid points. So what does that mean, though? Concept embraced. It means we're, we have to get public input in settings like this. We're going to issue a public survey. Uh, we need to have, um, you know, additional conversations with a butter such as yourself. To give you an example, we've hit, we've had conversations with Clean Harbors, but we haven't had a conversation with Clean Harbors with anybody at Clean Harbors that has a level of say so that would enable us to say, okay, we've got buy-in from that and butter. Um, 
So I think there's a lot more due diligence that has to be done before we jump into, you know, funding expensive studies and rounding up funding sources. That would be my thought. Mm -hmm. And any of a grant application for any of those services would require proof that we vetted this with the public Correct. and we have support. So this is all part of a bigger process to move towards where our funding sources. I think a good thought process, or at least my public opinion, is as it relates to clean harbors, is pull the project away. I think it's a better project. I've been a developer for 35 years, done quite a bit of work in this area. And I think it would be a far better project to keep it closer to Sutton Pond and closer to that industrial building with barrels and stuff on the backyard. Yeah. Um, and then you eliminate that obstacle you just brought up. Yeah, no, that's good feedback. And I mean, that's the type of feedback we want, you know, and, and certainly if anybody other anybody else in the audience has uh, ideas on the, the path that we're taking and, and maybe the, the good and bad of, of the way we're laying it out currently, we'd appreciate your feedback. I'd say, you know, with respect to GPI, the folks we brought on board, I know you all have done many rail trails uh, in areas that have had all kinds of precarious situations, uh, land use and, um, you know, former uh, industrial sites with brownfields and tr tricky ownership situations and right-of-way issues. So mm -hmm. we're kind of relying on the collective um, body of evidence that's before us on, I think Ron made a, made a point earlier, what's going to be the path of least resistance? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the path of least resistance isn't the, what we had thought would be the best path as far as, you know, what would work nicely, what would look good, what would feel right. Um, but at the end of the day, when you when you think of when you you know toss everything into the mix, you know cost and you know uh, how easy or how long it's going to take to secure the rights to go in certain ways. You know we want to we want to game that all out before we make any hard and fast decisions on any of this. Mm -hmm. the, the first part of it is putting something together that appears to work. The next step is to really pin it down. And make okay, it work. Because you still get to verify it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I'm going to lead you through a little bit of visualization, give you a sense of what it would look like. All credit goes to Sage for her work on this. So we're going to start uh, up on the dam, looking um, sort of the long view of the pond. I guess it's about, about the southerly view. There's the existing picture. Um, I think I showed you before. It's just a lovely view of the pond. and. A recreation of kind of that boardwalk, what it might, or the trestle, what it might look like uh, crossing there. Um, kind of, here's some pictures of a, of a project we actually did in uh, the Asaba River Rail Trail um, of a wetland crossing. This was done because the, the piece of the railroad had been bought off and the line was no longer available. Um, here's a view from Main Street. At the salon on the left there, sort of this funny little piece of land right in here is kind of the, yes. where the, the right of way is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is kind of what we envision, sort of just eking out enough room in there to, to make it through, but not overly impacting the, the properties on either side. Kind of a slightly different angle of that. Give you a sense of that. Where would the parking be right there? Just those spaces, a couple spaces right there? No, I think the parking here would have to be on street. Right? There's no room within those properties. Everything they've really done. Yeah. Yeah. I know it is. Even with limited street parking. Yeah. You know, well, I, I know. I mean, Ralph's parking lot is usually empty during the day. <laughs> Get some guys in trouble, the wives will think they're at the bar. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, we haven't really explored where we, we talked that there's probably a need to identify it. You know, these kinds of things. Well, he had mentioned the, the parking lot behind over, Davida. Over know, there, trying yeah. Trying to figure out what that, that ideally, that's what the only space down there. Yeah. And then and right there, it gets hectic even in the mornings till almost like 11 because it's heavenly. I almost died taking a picture. Heavenly <laughs> donuts, there's nowhere to park. You don't have a drive through and it's yeah. like everybody's like going crazy to get their coffee. Yeah, it was, it was Sunday morning, I think. I just got my hair cut. So. <laughs> I, I had to wait a long time. With, one, get no cars in the picture, and two, get back across the street. Uh, third image, this is looking... This was the this was the tough one. This is actually looking from the bank across the pond where the little trestle was. Took a bit more imagination here. 
Um, but sort of this is the vision of people being able to use the bridge in all kinds of different ways. Duck face selfies and all that. <laughs> um, yeah, one on the dam area. Did you do that one? was a, that was the first one. I, we didn't do one sort of of the area around there, but it was looking from the dam. This is over at Avalon in the fire lane. That car's only parked there, I think, because of construction. But there's no parking it's supposed to be there. So that sort of visualized that we would come along there and then navigate that little slope. And that's where it plunges into the woods to go around that old ball field. Is that Avalon North? It's Avalon North, yeah. Um, this is in the Avalon North parking lot. High Street's kind of behind the camera. So we're sort of envisioning that a pathway through the parking lot. We're, we're trying to have fun with some of the crosswalks or the, the paths, you know. So we're, ex we're experimenting with color. <laughs> and then uh, last but not least, kind of crossing High Street with all the bells and whistles that it would take to make this a safe crossing. But, uh, and we greened up some of the trees too. They just, they're still finishing up some of that. So with that said, we have a survey. I think the town's gonna post this online. You can take a picture on your Hand out the QR codes. Hopefully it'll work off this if it's not too pixelated. Um, there's only like six or seven or eight questions, I think. Um, feel free to do that now or you can do a, take, take a picture of the, take the QR home and do it at home. Give it to all your friends. <laughs> um, give you a couple minutes. Exactly. We'll also, um, sorry to interrupt, Ron, but we will also share out details of this meeting uh, in the next week or so, yeah. and we'll share a direct link to the survey as well if you didn't get a chance to do it here, and obviously we want to give people around town an opportunity to uh, chime in with their thoughts, um, and we can also print out some hard, hard copies that we can leave at the library, um, right. town hall, and elsewhere. Right. You'll get it on the social media. Um, yeah, any, anytime we beam this out, it's social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we have our, you know, people sign up for emails through the town, town news, so it'll be through that as well. Uh, that'd be great, yeah. I, I'm, I founded the North Hanover Dads page on the admin there, and I moderated the mom's page as well. And a lot of the concerns I had have been a major concern to the community. People talking about this, what's going on with the kids. They're going to do another <coughs> development at the end of Second Street with the old Santander Bank. Is it yep. like what's going to take away from our kids and the future <coughs> generation? So I, I think that's where a lot of the concerns come from. So if we get something like that, we can put it on there and then um, hopefully get the word out and come together a community. I know we're trying to look for the least paths of resistance, but ultimately it's what's best for the community and our future generations, our youth and, and, and our elderly, and give them something to look forward to in the town. The interesting thing about that, though, this, this whole area is a very good area where a lot of families in town have very warm views of the Pussy Bridge and all of that going on. So it's almost tying the past with the future. Mm. Um, a lot of people mm. love that area because they went fishing and had fun. And, I did all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm with that, so I can't wait to see what we come up with. Um, I think I had. So you asked about next steps. Complete this feasibility, and then I think it, it moves to the next step and, and find funding for it, secure easements and property design it and build it. Those are kind of the steps. The timing, that's what needs to be determined. So, And um, with that, um, any last questions? Or we've got a couple layout, a couple of the plans in the back. Feel free. We've got sticky notes and pens and stuff. Feel free to leave us comments, thoughts. Love it, hate it. <laughs> and I just, uh, before we hop to the back, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming because obviously you can you know, people are gonna go to the maps, put in notes if they want, and I'm sure you'll filter out. But I just wanted to thank everyone for coming, and um, you know, again, we have a page up online that uh, um, you can, I think, find through either the planning, or both the planning department website and community development website on the town's website. There are links to this uh, that are nested under the downtown plan. 
So we have a few different links to different things going on in the downtown. We're working on a rezoning project. We're working on, uh, we have the downtown improvements master plan itself. Um, and so this is also nested under that, which you can find. Uh, and feel free to reach out to my office if you have any questions. And we'll certainly post any future meeting dates or discussions or any other, uh, other public items that come out of from this. But uh, I want to thank Ron and his team for presenting. Thank you. Um, and again, <laughs> Everyone's support and input. Thank you. So, thank you. 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 Thank you.